If you've been following this series for any length of time, you've seen me put the Autel scope module to work more than once. But here recently, many of you have written in asking for a more detailed tutorial on using this scope in particular. And that's what we're going to do in the next few editions of The Trainer. This edition of The Trainer is brought to you by Autel. To learn more about the entire line of Autel professional diagnostic tools and equipment, visit www.autel.com. Many of you have asked me or Autel directly to do some more training specifically on the use of the digital storage oscilloscope, particularly the Autel scope module that comes with their scan tools. I'm very excited about this project and I hope that you are too. I'm a firm believer that there are many diagnostic situations you'll run into that you can't resolve without a scope. And a scope helps make troubleshooting in general a lot more effective and a lot more efficient. The DSO or digital storage oscilloscope is a cousin of the multimeter you are likely using today. Both are digital instruments rather than the old analog tools we used years ago. The difference between digital and analog is that the signal the digital tool is connected to is not displayed directly on the tool screen. Instead, the tool samples the signal and converts the signals into a digital signal through an AD or analog to digital converter. The accuracy of the displayed measurement is based in part on how many samples per second the tool can take. The more samples it gathers, the more accurate the signal display. And here is where there's a major difference between a scope and a multimeter. Most scopes today can sample several millions of times per second, while even the best of the multimeters on the market may only be able to sample 700 to 800 times per second. Another feature the scope has over the multimeter is the ability to display the signal over time on the screen. This gives us a pictorial description of what is happening and makes it easier to dissect and understand. And with the right accessory probes, the scope can be used to test more than just electrical problems. It can be used to check pressure and or vacuum. It can be used to check current in a circuit. And it can even be used to determine the cause of noise, vibration, and harshness complaints your customers may be having. Now, before we get into those more advanced testing techniques, the first thing I want you to do is become comfortable with the tool. Now, we're going to focus on how to use the Aut Telescope module in particular, but the things we discuss in this series apply to any scope that you might own. I want you to be comfortable in how to set voltage and time, how to get a good pattern on your screen, and how to take advantage of the different triggering techniques, just to name a few. So I'm going to encourage you that as you watch this video the second or third time around, have your scope handy and a vehicle that you can practice on close by. And the very first test that I'm going to show you is one that you can perform on every single customer's car that comes into your bay. It's a test of the battery starting and charging system. It's a valuable way to help you learn your scope while providing a very real service to your customer. Let's start by accessing the scope function on my MS919 and setting up the hardware. This particular scope can take up to four different measurements simultaneously. Each one is referred to as a channel, and having more than one allows for a broader use when it comes to troubleshooting a problem, as you'll see as we go along. I'm only going to use two of them today. The first channel I'm going to use as I would any other voltmeter. After all, the digital storage oscilloscope can only measure voltage inputs. I'll connect the measurement leads to the first input channel, and then, Using the clips that came with the tool, I'll connect the other end of the measurement leads 
to the battery's terminals. Now I need to set up the measurement parameters on the scope itself. The first is the voltage range I want the scope to be able to display. Since most of the systems you'll be testing are part of the 12 volt vehicle system, we'll only need a range of measurement of 20 volts or so. The second is the time range I want the scope to display. This is going to vary depending on what system you are trying to connect to. But in the beginning, I want you to follow what's called the 2020 rule. Now the first 20 we've already taken care of, and that is set our voltage range to cover at least 20 volts. The time range is the second half of the 2020 rule. 20 milliseconds per division, or 200 milliseconds across the entire screen. Now let me explain that a bit more first. The screen is divided typically into 10 sections we refer to as divisions. Now you might be asking yourself why 20 milliseconds per division or 200 milliseconds across the screen? Well, that's a good question. That's about the amount of time it takes a gasoline engine at normal operating temperature to complete two full revolutions at idle. Using these basic 2020 settings will guarantee that I'll get at least something on the screen to start off with and I can home in on it from there. The battery charging starting system test that we're going to take today though is going to need more time than that on the screen. So instead of 20 milliseconds per division, I'm going to bump that up to 500 milliseconds per division or five seconds across the screen. The next thing we need to do on setting up our scope is decide on a trigger. Now what's a trigger? A trigger is a setting that tells the scope what to look for and when to begin its trace. There are a few choices we have to make in setting up our trigger. And the first is what type of trigger do we want to use? I use the single trigger function the most because it allows me to perform the test alone and it works great when performing the battery starting charging system test. With this setting, the scope will start to trace using the parameters I set for it and will stop as soon as the signal fills a single screen. And that's all I need for this check. The other options available to you on the AUT telescope and others includes no trigger, in which case the signal will be displayed randomly on the screen, or automatic trigger, which allows the scope to determine its own settings based on the signal inputs it sees or repeat trigger, which is similar to the single trigger, but the screen will refresh whenever the trigger settings are met. When using multiple channels, you can also select which channel you want the scope to trigger on. I'm gonna save that for channel B for the time being, and I'll explain why when we set up that channel. Now stick with me, it isn't that hard, I promise. We still have one more choice to make and that's called trigger slope. What that means is we're telling the scope that input level that I discussed, and when we wanna see if it's going down, which would be a falling slope, or going up from that point, which would be a rising slope. Which one you pick is really dependent on what channel and what type of signal that you're using as your trigger. I'll explain more when we get to channel B. I promise. One more thing we have to position the trigger relative to the screen itself. For this test, I like to put the trigger near the first division line. The scope will also record the data that occurs just before that trigger point that you placed on the screen. And this allows me to catch some additional information, specifically battery open circuit voltage, which is a number that I need in order to fully assess the battery starting and charging system. And that takes care of setting up channel one. Now, as I kind of alluded to, we're doing something a little different on channel two or B as it's labeled on the AUT telescope module. For that channel, I'm going to use what's called a high amp current probe. What this tool does is react to the magnetic field around a conductor when electricity is flowing, it converts that to a voltage input that I can trace on my screen. So I'll be able to watch not only the voltage changes as I perform this test, but the current changes as well. 
And that could tell me a whole lot about the condition of the battery starting and charging systems that we're trying to test. There are certain accessory probes that I could not live without in my normal routine testing. And the high amp current probe is one of them. The other and right behind it, number two, is the low amp current probe. So I encourage you to invest in these two as soon as you can add them to your scope arsenal. You'll be glad you did. And if you're using an Autel, you can actually get the Autel scope accessory kit, which includes both of those probes and a few others. I'll start by connecting the probe to channel B on the scope module. And then I'll turn the probe on and place the jaws around one of the battery cables. Either will work, but typically the ground cable is the easiest to get to. Now for the settings we need to input. In this case, the first is probe selection. On the Autel scope and others, you can access this menu and select the probe you're using from a drop down list of probes that that particular manufacturer offers. This will automatically convert that voltage scale to an amperage scale. And then I can select the scaling based on the preferences I selected on the tool itself earlier. Next is the actual scaling for the vertical or voltage access. Since this is in current now, I'm going to select the zero to 1000 amp range to start. Now I said that we were going to talk about input level and trigger slope once we got to setting up channel B. Well, as you can see now, I'm using current on channel B and I'm going to see a lot more current change than I will voltage change. And that's why I picked it a lot easier to set up that trigger. So I'm going to set it up at a falling slope because when the starter cranks over, it's going to draw current and I'm going to set it for about a hundred amps because we know it'll draw at least that much to get this engine to turn over. Once those settings are in place, all that's left to do is start my scope and then start the engine. Take a look at the green trace, channel B. That's our current pattern. It drops dramatically, doesn't it? This is showing a huge current drain on the battery and the probe is in the correct orientation, but for some reason, most techs are used to viewing it with the current drain rising on the screen. I just happen to be one of those techs and if that's how you prefer to view it, all you have to do is turn the probe around or use the invert function to change the display. With both patterns on the screen, the Autel scope allows me to drag the zero line up or down so I can get some separation between the two, making them even easier to see. Now let's take a closer look at what we captured, starting with channel A, the red trace, which is voltage. Now when I'm doing a basic starting charging system test, the first thing I need to know is the condition of the battery or what its open circuit voltage is. So we use that cursor to get a measurement and we can see that we're measuring about 12.4 volts. That's a little less than what I would like to see, but not enough where I'm going to forego the rest of the test for the time being. Next thing I want to take a look at is what's loaded voltage. In other words, how low did the battery go when it was placed under load? So we'll just move our cursor down to the base of that voltage and see a shocking 8.84 volts. Now weren't we taught that 9.5, 9.6 was the absolute minimum for loaded voltage and anything below that needed to be replaced? Well, not here. And the reason why is that this is not loaded voltage. It's called inrush voltage. And it's that microsecond of time that it took to get the starter energized and moving against all of the inertia of the engine. This creates a very high voltage drop and high current draw, which you'll see in a moment. But it's only for a microsecond, a millisecond at best. So this number is above what we consider a normal minimum of 8.5. So this is okay. So far, so good. Then we see the engine start to turn over and then you can see that it starts running and it starts to replenish 
uh, with the charging system starts to put back into the battery what was taken out and not too long after we start it we get up here to our peak of 14.63 now normal charging voltages is 13 and a half to 14 and a half correct so I'm pretty happy with this one no problem that I can see so far in either the battery the starting or charging systems if I were to measure say 17.5 volts would that be a problem put your opinions in the comment section and let me hear what you have to say pro and con so now we'll take the the voltage out of the screenshot so we can focus just on the current and we're going to start off just as we did before we're going to start measuring right at that peak there we go i'm going to move that over we can see it a little bit better and you can see that the peak here we're measuring 620 amps okay that's not starter uh, current that's not starter current draw like we're used to doing conventional testing uh, this is again like the voltage this is an inrush current measurement this is that microsecond of time it took to get everything moving so that's the starter working against not only itself but all the mass of the engine trying to get that to, to turn over okay and now when we move a little bit further to the right you see these little peaks and valleys well that's the engine turning over and what you're seeing here is the impact of each cylinder having on current draw as it goes through top dead center of its compression stroke so a good healthy cylinder with a lot of compression is going to be harder to push through TDC than what would no compression would be. And we're seeing that extra current demand that the healthy cylinders are requiring. And we also see, of course, that the engine is starting to turn over, but it hasn't started yet. Now, I will say this, this particular part of the pattern can be a very useful diagnostic tool to help us compare one cylinder against the others. It's called a relative compression test, and you can find more about it right here on this channel. Now, once the engine's turned over, we see now the engine's running, the alternator's spinning, and it's starting to replenish what was taken from the battery. Now, whenever you use the cable, I don't, I don't care what side of the battery you use, positive or negative, but make sure you're around all of the cables at one time. And what we're gonna look here is the peak current coming out of the alternator. And that's reading almost 78 amps. Now, that is the net good to the vehicle, to the battery. And I want you to keep in mind here, we're only looking at five seconds worth of time. Notice how that, that starts to taper off a little bit as it continues to the right of the screen. If you really want to get a good measure of the health of the battery and alternator, look at this after it's been running for about two or three minutes and to see what that number is. What you're seeing here is the system's need to replenish everything it took out of that battery as quickly as possible to diminish the amount of energy needed to run the alternator, which of course takes away from driving the wheels and fuel economy. Well, hopefully after watching today's video, you're going to be more comfortable in using your Autel scope. But like I said earlier, much of what we discussed is applicable to any scope that you own. Only the buttonology is going to be different, and that's something you can learn easy enough. We covered what voltage scaling is and how to use that. We've covered time scaling, what that is and how to use that. We talked about accessory probes, trigger types, and we took our first test. And I want you to practice that test on every vehicle that comes into your bay. It's, only, it's not only good for your customer, it's good for you too. It makes you more comfortable with your tool. And the best way to learn a new tool is to use it on a lot of known good cars. Don't wait for that problem child to come in before you break out the scope. Now, next time, we are going to dive a little more deeply into the diagnostic power your scope offers. In particular, we're going to look at the fuel delivery and fuel injection systems. Thanks for watching.